You and I were talking earlier about how when you inherit a job, there's so much on your plate. There's so much noise. And then you start one in three, and then some of the noise is a little negative. And then you show some promise. And then the preview magazines like you, and then the noise is a little more positive. <laughs> You've but, created but, some but, of that. Well, look, look, guilty as charged. Um, so when I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. But how do you, um, how do you make sure guys realize it, it's, all, it's all the same? It's all just noise. Like it doesn't impact what you do on third and three on Saturday. Yeah, I think it's, it's about what you hear a lot of coaches say, trusting the process and make sure that we really do that. You know, that's what, what we can control is what phase we're in, which for us, winner's phase one. We don't worry about anything else but our winter program. Spring is phase two. We don't worry about the winter. We don't worry about summer. Let's win phase two, and this is how we got to do it. Summer's phase three, and preseason is phase four. So we break it down in those phases and we just say, these are the things that we have to do well to win this phase. This is where our efforts go. This is where our attention is. If we don't, you know, it's hard to go on to the next phase and feel good about it. So trust in the process, um, staying humble, staying hungry, reminding them how we got there, how we moved the needle and, and became a better team that we can't lose sight of that. And we've always been grounded in fundamentals and 100 level. So right after the season, it was hit the reset. We're going back to the basics, guys. Winter and spring is about 100 level things that we have to be great at. When I grew up, Virginia Tech was a national championship contender. And um, I find sometimes in our college audience, maybe like even the 18 to 30 year old audience, you have to remind people that is this place at its maximum potential because they've seen it in their adolescent and formative years differently. When you're recruiting guys, how often do you have to sort of press that button on them of, no, 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 no. When this place is right, take a look at this. Let me hit the rewind button. This has happened here before. It's not just, you know, sunshine and unicorns and stuff. It's actually been real. And then how do you sell them on the idea that we can get back there? Yeah, I think a couple things. It's a great question. I tell recruits and families all the time that this place was Clemson before Clemson was Clemson, <laughs> truly. Yeah. And in the same breath, seven conference championships in about 15 years. Seven conference championships in 15 years. Who does that sound like? Ohio State? Alabama? Like who's, who's winning those kind of league championships that frequently? And that was Virginia Tech. And then the second piece of it is I was here for a Sugar Bowl championship. I was here for an Orange Bowl. I was here for two conference championships. So were several members of my staff. We know what it looks like to win championships here. I would never have left Penn State and James Franklin if I didn't believe we could do it here. If alignment wasn't here, if administration and the powers to be didn't recognize what I recognized about things we needed to do to get this program headed back the right direction. You had opportunities uh, that's pretty well known in the industry and publicly, I guess, kind of well known. You were at Penn State. You had opportunities both at the coordinator and probably the head coach level. You chose this one. Why? This was right for me. Now, I believe in Virginia Tech. I know what it's about. I cut my teeth here. It was right for me. This was, this was the opportunity where... I could be myself. The values and traits that are important to me, I believe are important for Virginia Tech's success. And I know you find them here in our community, on our campus, in athletics, and now you find them with our football team. Um, so a chance to, to be the head coach and not have to be somebody you know, that you're not. Pretend to be somebody else or things that, that aren't important to you needed to be. It's, you know, this was this was a good, great fit for me. Um, recruiting the state, having relationships here, you know, I was excited about what I felt like we needed to do at Virginia Tech. Um, so it was just a great fit. I was in your office earlier today, and you kind of, you know, you look out, you got one of the greatest views in the sport. You got practice fields, you got Lane Stadium in the background, and you said. You know, that's kind of surreal, you know, being me, being how I was brought up, being where I'm from. It's surreal that I'm the actual head coach here. Yeah. And then I was telling you, well, hey, they pay me to talk about college football. I never thought in a million years that could be possible either. 
how often do you just kind of find yourself two or three minutes just drifting off and realizing, <laughs> whoa, but actually it's real. Like, I'm not dreaming of yeah. it. It's real. It's really happening. I, honestly, I don't know if the schedule allows for that. <laughs> but I'm reminded every day I walk in my office because it was Coach Beamer's office. And, uh, you know, the respect and admiration that I have for him and the job that he did here, the impact that he had, not just on this football program, but this athletic department, this university, this community, Southwest Virginia. Uh, so that smacks me in the face every day and uh, makes you, you know, you feel an added responsibility, uh, not just to make coach proud, but everybody that's affiliated with our place. Uh, so many great lettermen and uh, great coaches and, you know, the tradition and the history that that exists now because of those people. So, but uh, it, it's surreal for me. You know, I, I was one of those guys. I didn't come up in the profession, you know, dreaming to be a head coach. Uh, you just, you know, came up, you know, directional schools and, and working your way and living paycheck to paycheck, just like my dad did for most of his career. Um, so, you know, in that sense, it's, it's surreal as well. When I was talking to guys around the building today, they said, hey, you, you're talking to Coach Pry. Yeah. Make sure you ask him about the stuff on the wall. They say, like, everyone's got stuff on the wall, but ask him about stuff on the wall. So right behind us, it says necessary mentality. What does it mean? Whew. So to me, you want to be elite in some trait. Like when, we, when we're recruiting, when we're developing guys, what is the elite quality that this, this individual has? And for me, I wasn't very fast, I wasn't big, I wasn't strong, but the mentality piece, that's like a skill. That's, that's, that's like how well do you run? How strong are you? How well do you catch the ball? How well do you throw the ball? Well, how great is your mentality? It's a trait that can contribute and impact what type of player you become. So the necessary mentality it's a skill that you can control and be great at, and it's not God-given. We can grow that and develop that and nurture that like we do everything else, running, throwing, catching, blocking, tackling. Um, so that is non-negotiable. You know, I can't say you have to run 4-4, but I can say your mentality has, you know, it has to be what it has to be, right? That's, that's non-negotiable. So it's, uh, it helped me. Uh, I think it's one of my better strengths or greater strengths. Um, you know, I've certainly got my fair share of weaknesses, but I think these guys would tell you, the staff and these players, that I'm going to bring the necessary mentality every day. Um, and that can, that can do a lot of good. I, uh, you guys were nice enough to let us in team meeting earlier this morning, and most of it is what it is. Uh, one part that I do actually want to talk about, though, is – there is accountability. There are things written on the wall, but then it's it's put in practice. Even in a team <laughs> meeting this morning, yeah. where you've got every position group and they're tracking every one of their guys. And when you do something that you should be praised for, you're going to get praised for it. But those red X's are also on the board, and not as a group, but as an individual, you're going to get called out when you don't basically exude this right here. Necessary mentality. It probably doesn't take too long for young guys to get called out on that front before they realize this is no fun at all. But is that something you've always done? Have you seen it done elsewhere? And what kind of effect does that have on guys? Because we can't do that in the corporate world. That's called an <laughs> HR violation. We can't really do that in the corporate world. So we did do it defensively at Penn State. It was something I started there, and it grew. Uh, when I got here, I said, we're going to do it with the entire team. Um, when, you, when you hold guys accountable or hold people accountable in front of their peers, it's just that much more meaningful, uh, significant. And uh, nobody wants to see those red X's go up on that board in front of 150 people uh, that you were late to a lift or you got your, your car booted for parking in a handicapped spot. You know, they want to see extra miles for helping somebody shovel their driveway or leading a class discussion or, you know, helping a teammate out, whatever it is. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, everybody always had talked about accountability. And uh, it was how do, we, how do we really put it into action and make it more meaningful and tangible. Um, so we spend the time once a week in a team meeting setting. We're going to go through each position. And then at the end of the semester, the team with the most accountability points, the unit with the most accountability points, gets a really cool piece of gear tech hoodie or something, and somewhere on it in, in, in big print, it's going to say, count on me. 
because that was a group that could be counted on mm. the most. A lot of coaches, in fact, most head coaches say there are pieces of being a head coach you can never prepare for until you become a head coach. And you just nodded your head, and you're a couple of years into this now. What were the things that are on your plate now that you never could have prepared for until you just dealt with it? First, let me say I was very fortunate. Uh, First-year head coach Ricky Bussell, I uh, went with him to Louisiana Lafayette and kind of by his side through all the the learning curve there. And then to go to Georgia Southern with Jeff Munkin, another first-time head coach, and to be close to Jeff and, and go through that experience with him. And then obviously to go with Coach Franklin with James to Vanderbilt and then Penn State. And uh, to be a close confidant of his and uh, to have the, the good fortune to learn and and, and grow with him and, and you know, learn so much from him. Um, so there was a pretty good playbook for me about how I wanted to do this and what I wanted it to look like. NIL and the transfer <laughs> portal wasn't part of the playbook. There was no chapter in there uh, about those things. So, you know, there's, you know, with everything we do, we're genuine, we're transparent, we hit it head on, we embrace com hard conversations here. And that's a lot in that world. Those things I'm talking about, that's how we've handled it. And, uh, you know, so far, you know, we've, we've navigated it pretty good. How much have you learned about the characteristics you have to look for in other non-football-related departments? It all bleeds back into football, but you grew up as a football coach, coaching a position, you probably didn't worry a whole lot about sports science. You probably didn't worry a whole lot about putting nutrition plans together and putting right. those people in place. So on top of the football pieces, the on the field grease board type pieces, how much of a baptism by fire has it been learning about all the other tentacles that extend outward from a program? Yeah, I, there's been some learning there, but you know, again, at Penn State, James really pushed the envelope in all those areas. It was very important to what we were doing. And um, you know, so I had experience and uh, had a blueprint of, of what I felt like we needed to do in those spaces, but uh, you know, again, that's you have to rely on your staff. You know, you have to rely on on people to give you information that, you know, not that that's going to make your decision about what direction you go with something, but we have a lot of different departments that bring a lot of value and a lot of information, and it's up to me as the leader to take it all in and then make decisions that I feel are in the best interest of everybody. So. You know, we, we, are, we got smart people on this staff that are growing professionally, and there's a lot of outreach, there's a lot of professional development. Uh, so we're in those spaces, you know, whether it's analytics, whether it's sports science, and we're continuing to grow it here at Virginia Tech. It certainly wasn't where it needed to be when I was hired. We didn't have a sports science coordinator. It didn't exist here. Um, so we've... You know, there's been seven or eight positions we've added over two and a half years in those areas. When you take over a program and it doesn't have some of those blanks filled in, does it make you go, oh, well, that's a shame? Or does it make you excited because you know with those blanks filled in, I actually know that this place could scale quickly. You guys had several sellouts last year. I mean, not in playoff contention, nothing like that. And Almost every game over here is sold out, so then you ask yourself, well, uh, when we take those next steps, what could it be? But when you inherited the job and you look at it and it, there are so many incompletes that you would write on your term sheet, what kind of things does that make you feel immediately? <sighs> that you can't do them all at once. You want to because you see them, you recognize them, but uh, that the support from the administration is there, uh, and it is. Uh, we're moving in the right direction in a lot of spaces. Uh, maybe not the total move we need to make, but we're getting partway there in a lot of areas. And, uh, and it's making a difference. It's impacting our program already. So you have a blueprint. You have a map of we need to be here in sports science. We need to be here with nutrition, we, whether it's budgetary, whether it's staffing, whether it's you know plan and, and model that we want, whether it's facilities. And, um, you know, so we think in that space and we have an idea of where things need to go and then it's you know support from administration and and uh, you know you continue to sell out the stadium and have people support you and believe in what you're doing uh, we got tremendous support here 
and um, you know, in the middle of a rebuild, you know, not just from a fan base that you know provided five sellouts and twenty five thousand sitting through a rainstorm in the military bowl, but the administration, our donor base, our Letterman group, this community, um, you know, things are in place here for us to to move this needle, you know, just every year, just keep moving it the right direction. And we have to do our part. And we got to win enough games to keep people excited. And I think it's also the relationships that we build across the community, across campus. Uh, you know, it's the foundation of what we do. Uh, we're invested in the state, which was a, a really important piece to Coach Beamer and their success. Virginia was very good to them. And uh, so. Talking to some folks who cover recruiting, especially in the mid-Atlantic region, and talking to some folks who have recruited on other staffs, talk about once upon a time how hard it was to come into Virginia and take a kid. And if you got him, you knew you had a fight on your hands. And then that kind of waned a little bit. And now you guys have come back in the door. And so I know you kind of just touched on it, but, but one more time for me, this area kind of became a national recruiting hotbed because of maybe the lack of in-state schools holding talent home. You came in with the philosophy of taking care of home, obviously, but how much traction have you seen you guys able to get on that front? Yeah, we've, uh, I think, you know, we've invested in the state and the coaches and the communities are recognizing that. You know, we're in the schools every cycle. We're doing travel clinics for the coaches across the state. Uh, we're hosting a clinic here for coaches. You know, we're, we're, we're doing eight or nine camps. We're, you know, we don't recruit outside of five or six hours unless we absolutely have to or there's a Virginia Tech connection that makes sense. Um, we're we're going to recruit our footprint. So it allows us to really spend the time. You know, nobody should know more about a kid in the state of Virginia than us. Nobody should know more. We should start hearing and learning about these recruits in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. and, and what allows us to be in the conversation right now with Georgia or Penn State or Ohio State is the relationship we have, uh, that we should have a better relationship than anybody. And that should, with enough guys, it'll keep us in it till the end. And some of those guys have already elected to come here uh, over schools that maybe have are more notable right now. If you were to go to your Wikipedia page, that thing goes back a little ways. You're looking at your bio, the places you've been, the high school level, the college level, multiple positions and roles. Do you think back to maybe like a few forks in the road or real turning points in your career that you look at and say, I'm here today because of this person or this moment? Um, so my father was a college and high school coach for 45 years, kind of a journeyman coach. He and I have the distinction we both coached in a Rose Bowl and we both lost to USC. <laughs> so uh, we got that famous photo up at the house. But uh, so obviously his influence and, you know, I grew up, he's coaching small, small college ball in West Virginia, the back of 10 hour bus rides going to away games and at practices. And so, you know, that's been the most impactful in my life obviously my dad played at Marshall the year after the crash and just the passion for the game in our family both my brothers played college ball and um, so but then you know the opportunity to to be around just great coaches that were doing it the right way and treating people right and they weren't putting the wins above you know treating people right and and doing things the right way. Uh, Denny Dowds at East Stroudsburg University. Uh, then, you know, I have an opportunity to come here. And I, I've been very fortunate that way. Uh, Bud Foster has been a you know, huge influence on me defensively as a coach, but also in development and I, identifying, you know, strengths and weaknesses in personnel and, and then mentality. Uh, a lot of that I, I learned from Bud and saw the value in it and what it did for us here. But, uh, you know, situations and scenarios, I've been fired twice in this profession. And I'm convinced that, that how I handled that and the way I navigated that was one of the, you know, the two times where I grew the most. 
um, the adversity that this game presents, uh, you have to navigate that well. You got to come out the other side of adversity feeling good about it. And uh, whether it's hard conversations or hard situations, and certainly when you're fired and when you're fired with family, like a lot of coaches, you know, they've experienced that. You know, you, you can play the, the blame game and, and all this, or, you know, you can just put your nose down and, and work and be appreciative for the opportunity you have and, you know, work to the next one. And uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of things that, that uh, I think shape, shape us as coaches. And, you know, they say, you know, you're either a coach that's been fired or you're a coach that's going to be fired. So <laughs> I can't, hopefully I've crossed that bridge twice now so I know. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here. I just want you to react when I say it. Allman Brothers. <laughs> That's my band. Yeah. Yeah. Those are your guys. That's my guy. Yeah. I, I grew up on them uh, in high school and, you know, listening in on my, my buddy's parents' albums and you know, making cassette tapes off that stuff. And, and then I got, you know, I got into going to see them, you know, uh, in the summers and while I was in college, we would travel and go see those guys and you know once you get into a band you you learn about their influences and and the old school blues and jazz and everything that uh i believe you got to have a balance in this business it's too hard I, i can't be the coach i need to be every day if i don't have some other things that take my mind off of it and that's one of them my family i try and work out when i can and my music i love going to live shows and you know, you just can kind of leave everything else alone for a little bit and, and have some fun, enjoy yourself, you know, get your mind somewhere else. And then I feel like I'm ready to go, you know, by that next day. So, but, uh, yeah, there's not a practice that goes by at Virginia Tech where you don't hear an Almond Brothers song. <laughs> <laughs> That's not by accident. <laughs> how, many, uh, how many times have you had to maybe talk to players but definitely talk to staffers when they're doing everything they're supposed to, like they're checking all the boxes, but you look at them and you realize there is zero balance in this guy's life. And he may be 31 right now, but he may pay for it when he's 51. Yeah. How often do you have to have that conversation? A lot. Uh, we try and, you know, the culture we, we work at and, and, and want for our staff is as important as the one we establish with our players. And balance is part of that culture. Uh, we take half days. You know, they know they walk in my office. They want to, you know, there's a brother graduating. There's a grandmother's retirement. There's, you know, a baby being born. There's a, a sister's uh, signing day. So whatever it is, I mean, you know, I'm going to promote all of that. I want that. You know, that's family. That's that's part of balance, part of quality of life. And then uh, we have fun as a staff. You know, we, we work, work, work when we need to. And I'm going to make sure. Uh, I would hope they would say that Coach is a pretty fun guy and that um, you know, we're going to do things together that are fun and, and more relaxed because uh, it's hard what we do, especially now. I wanted to ask you this because I always love getting Coach's perspective. So everybody's got some weird part of this game that fascinates them. Like I love when we go on the road, I love checking out road locker rooms. I was talking to Shane Beamer about this the other day, and I love seeing how accommodating or unaccommodating those environments are. So it may be that or something completely different for you, but is there anything, maybe from the perspective of a coach, it's different. Is there anything that you look at and you say, wow, this is not in my day-to-day line of work necessarily, but I'm fascinated by this part of this sport? Uh, You know, there's all kinds of little things that interest me, you know, pregame warm-ups the differences that you see position coaches doing. You know, you got a corner coach on one team doing it this way. You got a corner coach on another doing it this way. Um, You know, I love walking in a stadium early and just looking around and see what have they done here? Like what's been important to them for for their their atmosphere, their environment in their stadium? Um, You know, I I love to, to come out prior to kickoff, like just prior, when we run out of that tunnel here and just kind of soak it up for a, for just a half a minute. Like, you know, I love to look around and see the crowd and, you know, just I think it helps get me excited um, and also just appreciate the opportunity. So, but every place is a little different, you know, and everybody's biased about their own place. But, 
I think we got a great one here. You got some memorable road places, you coached all over the place. You got some memorable places that if you were writing sort of the chapter of that in your book, this one, this one, and this one, those really stand out. Yeah, you know, obviously this atmosphere and the entrance, you know, the two of those things combined. You know, this is a group of fans that stand on their feet the whole game and cheer, and they got their sweatshirts on and blue jeans, and, you know, they're very into the ball game. Um, I think the entrance helps do that. But, you know, the whiteout at Penn State was awesome. I always loved that experience. That's a special one. I've coached at LSU at night. That's that's pretty pretty cool, too. Um, you know, I think uh, those are the ones that stand out the most to me. All right, we're going to be cautious with how we talk about this um, because, yes, I have been sort of bullish on the direction of the team. (laughs) You're in spring right now. So cautiously, what are you seeing that you like so far? And then just knowing your roster and your guys like you hope you do, what are some things that if you take care of business, you can be pretty good at this fall? Whew. Um, I think Kyron's doing a really nice job. One of the points of emphasis was just being able to to make accurate throws in tight coverage. You know, we did a nice job last year. There was a lot of open receivers. You know, and a lot of times he's out of the pocket, and but um, you know we realized that you know, there's going to be more challenges and tighter coverage and things. And and he's done a nice job. He's made some some good throws each and every practice that uh, are contested catches. You know, great job by the wideout. But he's putting that thing where the DB can't get it and the wideout can. And now that's growth. Um, I think uh, just, you know, our wide receiver room just continues to, to develop. Coach Mines has done a great job with that group from top to bottom. The development, the recruitment to it, the mindset. I think, uh, you know, what Coach Price has done with our defensive line, going from one of the worst teams in the league at rushing the quarterback, to finish in number two and top ten nationally, but we still, we still have room for improvement there to be the type of defense that we need to be at Virginia Tech. I mean, when I was here, we led the country in sacks. Uh, when I was at Penn State, we led the country in sacks twice. Like this, this scheme and what we're about, TFLs and sacks, and then we have to minimize explosives. Uh, that's an area that hurt us defensively last year. We could make the TFL the minus yardage plays, but then give up a big one, a run or throw. We've got to be better there. Um, so we're talking a lot about that. But um, probably the biggest thing is we've got you know, all these, these really good players that were productive starters that return. Right? We have a bunch of guys come back that you know what you're going to get for the most part when you put them out there. But then we have this whole second rung of guys, first and second year players, that are going to contribute, whether they get, you know, elevated into a starting role or they have significant snaps or they're on special teams, we're going to need that group. And that group, you know, this offseason is critical for them. You mentioned sacks just a second ago. All right, so let me get a, a, a grizzled defensive veteran's opinion on this. Uh, tackles for loss and sacks, that's, those are very, very front-facing stats. My mom could track those. So then you get the more advanced analytics crowd and a lot of coaches who will say, well, sacks aren't all that important, and I know, what, I know what people are saying when they say that. However, I've never seen a quarterback get sacked for positive yardage. So it is very nice to get the quarterback on yeah. the ground. Literally nothing good's happening for that guy when he's on the ground. And it is, while not the end-all, be-all, a great metric that defense just did something really well. It's great to pressure him, but it's great to get him on the ground as well. So when someone talks about sacks, when you talk about sacks, are you of the uh, overrated stat, or are you, yeah, we want as many of these as we can possibly get? That's a great question. And um, sacks are important to me because they're minus yardage plays and they're hits on the quarterback, on the guy that's going to touch the ball every snap. When you sack the quarterback, you got a chance to, you know, you're, you're messing him up, right? You're banging him up. You're getting good hits on him. You got a chance for sack fumbles. I mean, you know, that guy touches the ball. If you can get him rattled, if you, if you can get that decision maker, you're worried about that rush. But also, I've been around games and I've been around units that did a tremendous job of pressuring the quarterback and getting the ball out. 
didn't have the sack numbers, but man, you felt great about what they were able to accomplish and how they affected the game. Uh, we had a, a first round draft pick at Penn State, Jason Owe. Uh, his last year, he didn't have the sack numbers, but I think he led the country in quarterback pressures. Um, you know, so those things are valuable too. I was just wondering because I've gone all the way around the merry-go-round on that. Yeah, what's more, what's honestly more important to me because I, I, we were this way for a few years in my career. We were getting sacks and TFLs, but we were giving up plays, all big plays, all the time. Somebody's band was playing, and you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to sustain success or or really be a genuinely good defense that way. And uh, so that's when we started rolling in our explosive play goal. You know, we want to be top 10 in, in fewest explosive plays, coupled with top 10 in sacks or top 10 in TFLs. If you do that, that's a pretty good sign. All right, so we talked about what you could be good in this fall. I'll kind of wrap it up with this. Um, you know, sometimes there's maybe one thing in bright red Sharpie. We know we got to get better at this or we're going to sink completely. So it could be that or a number of things, and it could be for you personally or the team, but what has your focus, what keeps you up a little bit at night of we got to get better here, we got to make sure we take care of this? I, I think it's depth, to be honest. Uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind. We've just we've signed a bunch of high school players over the last couple of years. We've only gone these last two years to the portal for 12 total players. So there's development and growth in first and second year players that has to happen. There's going to be injuries. We're going to need reps from other guys besides this core group. So developing those guys, which thankfully it's, it's still the spring, right? You got all the rest of spring, you got all summer, you got preseason camp. We got to make sure as coaches that the snaps and the reps are going where they need to for the most part uh, to develop those guys. But the big thing for us, and, and, and we try and we will here towards the end of spring, we'll do it in preseason camp, we have to play complementary ball. We're not going to have an offense that is just going to beat the brakes off everybody every week, and, and it doesn't matter what defense and special teams do. We're not going to have a defense that just you know has four shutouts and two yards of carry and we're not going to have a kicking game with six returns. And, you know, we are a complementary group. And that's kind of the formula for us right now. And I'm great with that. But we got to make sure we can do that. When we didn't last year, we weren't able to win the game. When we relied too much on one phase, we couldn't win the game. Um, so we are a complementary group. And, uh, you know, so we're constantly talking and working at ways for our team to understand that. That means responding when one unit may be struggling, another unit can pick it up. It means that unit, you know, putting them in those situations where things maybe aren't going well, how do we get out of this? So, you know, complimentary ball, I think, has always been a you know, part of it at Virginia Tech. And it, it feels like when you look back on last season, we were at our best when we were doing that. Brent Pratt, this has been a fun day, man. Awesome, brother. We Glad you've been it. here. Thank you. Yeah, for sure.